climate activists got it long before most of us. They were seized of the urgency of the issues, the need to move quickly and decisively, to shatter long-held assumptions, and most importantly, to take action where necessary, radical action. They, held up, they hold up a mirror to the experience, to the lived experiences of so many people, particularly the marginalized and the oppressed. And at this COP, I think it's notable that there is more diversity among the climate activists than among the policymakers present. But activism has also become more complicated, fraught, and sometimes dangerous. At this forum, I've heard a lot of talk about the increasing role of other actors like big business. So what defines climate activism now? In this session, we're going to speak with an inspiring group of young activists from a wide range of backgrounds who, together, co-wrote a chapter called What Does Equity Mean to You? in Greta Thunberg's new book, The Climate Book. We're going to explore what our leaders can learn from their individual stories and from the decentralized models of the youth climate movement. How can they influence high-level negotiations and what can they teach us about enabling collaborative solutions while converging towards a common goal? I'd like to welcome the speakers to the stage, please. We have with us, starting from the far end, I hope I get this right, Nikki Becker is an Argentinian human rights lawyer. Disha Ravi is an Indian policy and governance advocate. Nakabuye Hilda Flavia is the founder of Fridays for Future in Uganda. Laura Munoz is from a native peasant family in the Colombian Andes. And Ina Maria Shikonga is a German Namibian war orphan who became a fashion designer. Thank you. So, as I mentioned in the intro, climate activism can also be, has, has really caught global attention at many times, but can also be dangerous. One of our speakers, Disha Ravi, um, was arrested in India last year for part of her work um, and is still facing charges. Can you just speak to us broadly, Disha, about what it's like being a climate activist in India at the moment? Um, I think being any sort of activist, including uh, environmental activists as well as land defenders, is quite challenging in India because we are constantly under threat, under surveillance, and we have to be really careful about our actions and our words, sometimes even our thoughts, because there are people who have been punished for thought crimes. Um, there are specific laws in India that are made to arrest activists, without any proof and without any trial, and they can be in jail for years before they even get bail or before their trial even starts, and that can take years. And it is a very challenging time to be an activist, but um, a lot of us collectively believe that it's important to continue our work in the face of such injustice. Um, can I turn to you, Laura? in your context, I mean, getting, getting active, becoming an activist is energizing, you know, you feel that you're taking matters into hand, you're taking action, but as Disha was pointing out, the cost can be high. In your context, where you work, are there particular dangers associated with the work that you do? Sorry, I couldn't understand the Are there particular dangers associated with the work that you do? Have you, um, what kind of resistance have you met? Have you, are there costs, personal costs, that have made you reconsider your activism? Uh, I'm personally pretty lucky because I was uh, born and raised in Bogota, which is the capital. And in Bogota, we have a lot of violence, a lot of risk, but it is the capital after all. Uh, so in the other uh, regions of Colombia, the more rural regions, you can face that violence uh, like firsthand. Colombia, this, uh, according to the la last report of Global Witness, it was the second most dangerous country to be an environmental defender, and two years before that, we were the most dangerous country to be an environmental defender. 
but also I want to like highlight that the like the hot spot of that violence is the Pacific coast, which is actually where my vice president Francia Marque uh, she comes from. Um, Nakabuya, if I can turn Nakabuya Hilda, if I can turn to you. I, I noticed on the um, Fridays for Future website, at the moment it says, it is essential for our mission to present in spaces where climate decisions are being made. However, attending this COP is presenting unprecedented difficulties for our activists. Can you speak a little to what those difficulties are? Is that about getting access to this forum or other? Well, coming from a country in the global south that is on the verge of extinction because of the various climate effects we face. And also being an activist in such a country is really hard because already our, our rights are repressed. So speaking up against this repression and all the climate injustices we are facing is hard itself. And uh, given that we are black, we also face racial injustices, and being at COP wasn't that easy. Having troubles and challenges with getting budgets, getting COP funding, you know, getting accommodation, it, was, it had crazy prices. So all these are some of the challenges we face as activists in our way to you know, raise our voices, spread our stories, call for climate justice, and many others. What about in Argentina, Nikki? I mean, we don't have a COP in Latin America since a lot of years because in 2019 it was supposed to be in Chile and then uh, a massive protest happened. Uh, so it's really difficult because we live very far away in general from, for example, Europe in Madrid and Glasgow and also from Egypt in general. So it's really difficult to access to the funds, for example, because in Latin America, well, in Argentina, of course, but in Latin America in general, they have a very economic crisis, so it's really difficult to get the funds uh, to get into these type of events. And also, a language is a big barrier for us in Latin America, because it's not that everyone speaks English, and if you don't speak English, you, I mean, you can be here, but it's really difficult to make your voice here. Right. Is, is, is how many, I mean, is, are the, is there support for other languages at this COP other than English, or is it entirely in English? I mean, it's in, mostly it's in English. Uh, I, can't, I can't speak with my college for Latin American Spanish, uh, and I do it every time it's possible, because I feel more comfortable doing that. Uh, but if you want to speak in a panel, if you want to uh, do everything, you have to speak English. It's like a big barrier. Yeah. Ina Maria? Oui. <laughs> What, what, what sort of challenges have you met in the Namibian context? Um, the challenges, yeah, there are many, but um, coming from a country that has just had 32 years of independence, uh, we are still a very stable society. Um, yes, I also did receive uh, threats here and there, but also being one of the very first climate justice activists within the Namibian context, I've managed to create a very challenging situation for my government, which is known as a, you know, a very stable, beautiful country. Uh, also, it is a democracy, so they don't really know how to deal with me. And um, so I have, I mean, I was trained in Swapo camps, I was trained to become a soldier as a child. So <laughs> I am just using what they taught me, how to fight the system of capitalism, to remind them that, hey, our independence is so young. You taught us to fight capitalism because we were supported by the communist bloc. And now you are telling me to forget everything that you taught me. So with them, it is, uh, it is a paradox. They don't really know how to deal with it, and also being extremely vocal, and also on social media, but also within my voice, it is, they find it very difficult. I mean, they tried to arrest me, but my instinct just kicked in. I pulled out my phone, I was filming the cops, I was shouting at them, and they were completely destabilized. <laughs> so, but it is that fighter instinct that I have learned that they have taught me themselves uh, how to defend myself from 
the capitalists or the Boers because we were fighting apartheid at the time. So it is their education, what they taught me is now working against them. And it's, yeah, so it's in, I am using my past to, I am just using what I've learned to defend myself. And for them, I know it's not easy. So, so, so you responded, you resisted the arrest by fighting them off and, and you succeeded? Pardon? You said you resisted arrest by fighting them off and it succeeded? I just took out my phone and I was making a lot of noise and then there was a crowd obviously, so it was very difficult for them to take me away. And then, yeah, the video went viral, so they could not touch me at all. Yeah. <laughs> um, Repressive governments are obviously a problem that I think most of you face on this panel. Um, it seems to me that solidarity is also an important part of activism. Um, and here in Egypt, of course, act, uh, activists, political activists, and also some involved in the climate movement have been jailed. One is on hunger strike at the moment. Um, Naomi, Naomi Klein wrote before this conference that uh, Egypt's human rights record should preclude it from hosting the COP. I was wondering if you agree with that statement or if you or any of your colleagues had any second thoughts about attending this COP in the first place. Yes. Oh. Uh, I think um, it was a little bit conflicted for us to attend this COP because A, we wanted to come here because it is one of the first few African COPs and uh, African activists felt that it's important to, and I'll let the African activists in the panel speak about this, but um, it was considered important for the continent, and I agree with that. It's one of the first, I know there have been in the, uh, the other cops in the past in Africa as well as Asia, but it is important for us to address the issues that we are facing because we are on the front line of the climate crisis. Um, but at the same time, we also acknowledge that there ca can be no climate justice without political freedom, which is why um, I am personally in solidarity with Allah, who is in prison right now and struggling for his freedom, as well as other environmental defenders and political prisoners who are struggling for their freedom. As someone who has been in that place before, I can imagine the horrors that they have to face and the need for freedom of speech as well as our freedom to protest, and I believe that if that is taken away from us, we won't be able to atta attain climate justice. Yeah, I think it's, it's not casual that once we are here in a COP that is happening in Africa, finally we have loss and damages in the official agenda of COP. So it's really important to also uh, that uh, Egypt is held in this conference because it's also leading uh, the topics that uh, the, the official agenda is having. Do, do you think there's a balance between, for the UN or for the organizers of these conferences, between wanting to bring a diverse range of countries into the conversation, offer them a platform to host these conversations, and discomfort sometimes with the rights records in those countries? Well, I don't know, like, I, sorry, yeah, go, on. go on. Okay. Um, it's still difficult, like for us Latin Americans, we are like, I traveled like more for one, for more than one day to be here. It was like a travel of three trips, of three, yeah, flights. It was like 28 hours, like my knees are still hurting from that and I like arrived like three days ago. Uh, and like for this year, for example, uh, last year uh, in Glasgow, we got to be like 10 uh, climate uh, Colombian activists in Glasgow. Uh, despite we were in the, in the red list and we needed visa to get to UK, but Egypt is like even more expensive. And this year, like for example, we're just uh, three people for Fridays for Future. Uh, so, and like, again, the language barrier is very, very difficult. Even not only to speak here and to participate and to have a voice and like to make some kind of uh, action, but also like in the process, like to get the the uh, information of the visa or to get the sponsors, you need also to understand English and to have the contacts to, to, do, to do so. And Friday for Future is a beautiful network to do so. Uh, but I don't know, like, in regard, like regarding participation and inclusivity, um, like 
for us Latin Americans, I, at least, it was more and more difficult to be here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Ina Maria, did you have any second thoughts about coming? Um, yeah, yes, I did. Um, I did because I hate flying. <laughs> Again, travel injustice. <laughs> it is much more expensive for us Africans to travel than for, uh, well, not only Africans, but people from the global south to travel than for uh, people from the global north. But um, I feel that uh, my voice should be here. Uh, the climate crisis is affecting us right now. Uh, the drought is ravaging our people. And uh, being the only Namibian climate activist that could come, I had to come. So there was no doubt um, about being able to come or not. It's my voice is my people's voice. So I'm here for my people. Yeah. And that was Can important. Regardless of what may come. Please. Yeah. Well, uh, this being an African hope, an African cop, I really had a lot of hope. And for such an activist, it is my first African hope. So what I expected was way much compared to what I am seeing. I expected African voices to be presented, to be present here at COP, but we've been having different restrictions, start with the visas, with the flights, with the funding, and all this accommodation process. It has been very hard for us to get space, and even yet, uh, after all this, we managed to get budgets, but then we are not included in the real negotiations where our voices would make a big difference. Yes, we are at present at COP, but we are not represented in these tables where negotiations are really taking place. So it seems like we are just here for pictures and say, yeah, Africans were here at COP, you can see the pictures, but the real change is not made. We are not in these negotiations, and that is what really makes the difference and the whole point of being at COP. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Some of your government, some African governments, though, are represented, n not in the same numbers as you would want, I'm sure. Um, do, do you feel that your governments are listening to your concerns? Well, my government uh, is not, the president didn't even come, so it shows that my country does not take climate change as a priority. And this is an urgent issue. If they had uh, climate change as a priority and took it as urgent as it really is, our president would be here. We would have a Ugandan booth, but all these are not present. We just have to look out to other countries and see what they are doing. But if they were taking it as a priority, we would have all these structures present. We would be welcomed. Our voices would be included in these indices and negotiations. But it's not the case. Could you speak a little to the structure? I'm interested in the structure of Fridays for Future. Um, I believe it's quite a flat leadership structure, which is in common with um, a lot of diver different youth movements that I've encountered. Uh, I was covering the um, political protests in Sudan recently, where the, uh, the um, youth movement is protesting against the military junta, and they have organized along a very horizontal structure of um, cells of community organizations, and they've refused to um, elect a leader to represent their cause uh, in negotiations with the government. It seems that that's something perhaps in common with your movement as well. Do you see that as a, what are the strengths of that movement, if I've described it accurately, or of that structure, um, and what are the challenges that it brings? Um, I think one of the benefits is the fact that no one's put on a pedestal, at least internally. The media still does it, unfortunately. Uh, but we all know that we're here for a cause. It's not about uh, pushing one person at the spotlight, but it's about solidarity and sharing our stories and struggles. We identify that our stories are um, the pathway to changes in action, in policy action especially. And that is one of the reasons that we've been able to stay horizontal. Uh, one of the, I think, challenges is that they can, it can be a little chaotic, but that's the fun of it. Um, and, but we ha we've built a community that is based on love and support, and we've prioritized that because we believe 
uh, that saving the planet is about fighting for love, our love for each other, our love for the inhabitants of the planet, and our love, our love for the planet itself. And it's because of this belief that we've been able to build a strong community and continue our work for climate justice. Yeah, I think one of the most amazing things of being an activist is meeting also amazing people all around the world where you can also make campaigns together, but also support uh, to each other, but also understand that, that not everyone has the same platform. So we work a lot to make sure that people who are already suffering the consequences of the climate crisis has the same voice that others that live maybe in countries that they speak about the climate crisis, but in some of our countries, it's really difficult to speak about it because the media don't care, because the, the, uh, the politics in general think that the climate is not a priority. So also Friday for Future work a lot to try that uh, every activity that is part of Friday for Future, but not only Friday for Future, I would say the climate movement in general uh, has the same voice in this fight. I'm, I'm sorry, I just Please. want to say something quick. And one of the things that I say, like that it is key uh, about climate action and like to achieve climate justice is uh, to create safe spaces where uh, diversity is the foundation and the coloniality the path we tread. Actually, that's one part of the text that I wrote for the book. Uh, and it's because I don't know if people know, especially Western world, that like the, uh, for example, the Amazon rainforest on like the most biodiverse um, ecosystem and like parts of the world, like it is precisely diversity not only of trees and not only of animals, but also of cultures, languages, of uh, communities that live there, that are the ones who maintain that biodiversity. That is intrinsically linked. And that is very linked to our movement also. Like Fridays for Future, uh, at the beginning especially, it was a pretty Eurocentric movement because it was born uh, in Sweden. I love Reta, but like, it's in Europe, uh, and that's why it exists, Fridays for Future MAPA, Fridays for Future Most Affected People and Areas, um, and precisely like the diversity of the knowledges and the voices inside Fridays for Future MAPA is like crucial to achieve climate justice. Yeah. I'll uh, just uh, mention something. Go ahead. Before. Yes, I agree with my fellow activists. There is a lot of solidarity and working together. But what I just wanted to highlight is that uh, voices from the global south should be given space equally like the way of voices in the global north are given space. I think there is a gap uh, between these voices because if a voice from the global south wants to get attention and uh, call for action, it has to be shared by activists in the global north. And no one can tell your story better than you do. You're living the experiences. You're seeing the damage in your community. You don't need a white or a global north activist to tell your story, for God's sake. We are not given this space. We face these effects, but we find a gap in sharing our spaces. It, sorry, in sharing our voices. If we need to be heard, we need to share our voices with activists from the global north, which is not the case because they can't tell our stories better than we do. I also want to add. <laughs> um, can I ask you, Nakabi, um, were you at the last COP in Glasgow? Do you see, is there an improvement in the sort of access that people like, that you've had to tell your story or people from the global south? I wasn't at... Uh, uh, COP last year, but what I had and what I saw with my fellow activists during our sharing is that you had to work hard f to get your voice in the media, to get interviews, you had to know someone who knows someone, you need these connections, and it was really hard to share our voices as people from the Global South, because priority was given to people in the Global North, mm -hmm. and since the COP was in the Global North, they were given priority. And that is the expectation I carried to this COP, that since it is in Africa, maybe uh, voices from the Global South will be given priority, but it's still the same case. Our voices are not really shared to the extent we want them to be shared. Thank you. Just again on this issue, though, of the horizontal structure of leadership, um, 
while it encompasses the diversity of voices that you speak about, um, does that create challenges in creating common positions? Because even among yourselves, you come from such a wide variety of places, different challenges. Are there differences that divide you too, and how do you overcome those when you're trying to create a common voice? I think it depends from where you come from and what your context is. Like we focus more on climate action because climate advocacy is not necessarily always safe, especially when we work with young people, but we focus on climate action. And why? Because we cannot wait for the 100 billion that was promised. So it is up to us to make that change. So we are walking the talk like the, like the Secretary General said. So it really depends on where you are coming from and what the context is and also what the urgency is. But definitely, most of us in Africa, we focus on climate education because it is part of climate action. And also, when we are sitting in this space right now, people are negotiating and looking for solutions when we have the solutions. And people keep on still ignoring us. And that is why I think it depends on where you are coming from and what the urgency is, also depending on where you're coming from. Because Namibia is not Colombia, for example. We are a desert. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm just curious um, what you all see in your own futures. You've all, I'm sure, got long careers ahead of you um, um, in climate activism and elsewhere. Do you see your climate activism remaining within the activist sphere, or do you see yourselves moving into a government or elected positions, how do you see the balance between calling for global action and trying to affect local change in the communities through elected structures, for instance? Or do you see yourselves working outside those? Um, I think activism isn't in one form or shape. Activism isn't just taking to the streets and protesting. Activism is in many different forms. You, as a journalist, um, telling stories on the front lines is a f form of activism. Me, as a writer, writing about my experiences and my opinions is a form of activism. People organizing in the background and, you know, talking about um, logistics is a form of action. Us having musical productions um, to celebrate our culture and our diversity together is a form of resistance in the face of um, injustices and a world that doesn't want us to feel climate joy or joy in general. So in the future, I see myself doing climate action, maybe in the same form or maybe in different forms, but I know that I'll be doing this until we achieve climate justice, until we achieve a better world, a better present as well as a future for ourselves and our children. Nikki, could you could you see yourself moving into an elected position, for instance? No, I don't think so, <laughs> but it's really <laughs> necessary. I hope a lot of climate activists or people who now is part of the climate movement then move forward to politics in general, because we do need uh, politicians who care about the climate crisis, and we knew, the, as Disha said already, people being journalists, people being teachers, and it, really like every person has an important role in the climate fight. Uh, so, to be honest, I don't know what I'm going to do in the future. Maybe it's because I don't know how my future will look like, and that's part of why, uh, or why uh, it's so difficult to imagine myself uh, in the future and what I'm going to do. Uh, but for sure, uh, as Tisha said, I will be an activist since we achieve climate justice, since we achieve uh, in general social justice, and maybe in different ways. Uh, but, uh, of course, I want my fellow activists to be in politicians, uh, to be a politician, because <laughs> we really need you. that. Yeah, <laughs> it's part of a, a generation change that we need. Yeah. Can, can Please, Laura. Okay, I don't know, like, one thing about activism is I see it as a pretty Western world, uh, because the climate crisis didn't start 10 years ago in 2019 when we started striking, or, I don't know, like, uh, in the 70s, 60s, with the other environmental movement. Uh, it started at least for us 500 years ago when the Spanish, when the European conquest started. And we have been spoken, speaking, we have been speaking since then. Uh, so we have been like activists since 500 years ago. The thing is just only until the, uh, 
climate crisis, until the crisis, the poly, cri poly crisis was felt in the global north, it became a crisis. But we have been in crisis for 500 years ago, and we have been speaking, maybe not only not, not under the attack of an activism, so it like, I definitely, and I think that we are definitely keep speaking. I don't know if yeah. under the attack of activism, but <laughs> yeah, we, we were still speaking up. Yeah, and um, just to add on, Please. I just wanted to share that uh, I think activism is the way in which people share experiences, share stories. It's not only just being vocal, but we also go down to the actions. I myself like working with communities, with grassroots, and I think drawing from uh, the past challenges or revolutions that we've seen, for example, my ancestors had to fight apartheid, slave trade, all these struggles started with organizing on ground, having backyard movements and meetings to create the change that led to the stop of all these struggles. And I think that is one thing we should, or me or uh, the team I work with, we are looking at working on ground with these communities because we know that uh, change doesn't come from the government. We know that you in conferences don't change the world, but it's the people, it's the power of the people that does all this change. And we activists believe that the power of the people is bigger and stronger than the people in power. And that is how real change will come, bottom up. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, unfortunately, we're running out of time, but I just wanted to see if there was anyone in the audience who'd like to contribute or ask a question to one of our panelists. We have a number of people with mics running around. If you can raise your hands. Yes, we've got one here in the front row, please. Hi, everyone. I'm Mitzi Janelle Tan, and I'm a climate justice activist from the Philippines, also one of the contributors of the book. And I just want to echo what the activists have already said here, where a lot of activism is about building community. And it looks different in every shape and form. But in all forms, it is about creating that collective together. Because the system that we're in today makes us think that we're individuals alone. That we are one person separated from nature, separated from the ecosystem, separated from each other. But equity, which is what our chapter is about in the, Greta, in the climate book by Greta Thunberg, is about justice. It's about community. It's about love. It's about care. And that's what we found in this global youth movement. And I am so privileged to be such amazing friends with such amazing women. And that's the thing, that even as we grow older, and we will eventually stop seeing each other every year, that love that came from our joint activism and joint struggle will stay with us. And we will bring it in everything we do and we will be touching lives in everything we do. And every single one of us here can do that exact same thing because there is no limit, there is no level that you have to achieve to be an activist. Everyone can do it. And that's what the book is calling for, for all of us to come together and become climate activists. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for that contribution. Um, one very last point before we go, we're almost out of time. Um, do you, th th that speaker there spoke about the connections that she hopes will endure between your group and more broadly as you go forward. In practical terms these days, you know, do those connections, you came together to write this chapter, but there, are there other ways in which you practically help each other in your activism from one country to another? Yes, <laughs> we call each other all in tears. <laughs> what should I do? <laughs> but um, uh, I think we are definitely a family um, in our own right. I think most of us are mostly on our phones than <laughs> in real life. <laughs> uh, we support each other on so many different levels um, with mental health, um, um, giving each other advice. I mean, I am one of the older ones, to, be, to say so, but I learned so much from, from these amazing women, so inspirational, and I think we are the definition of generational gap, working together, not just as youth, because I think most adults, 
maybe coming from an African context, we tend to look down on the youth as if they don't know what is going on. Mm -hmm. And um, that is not true at all. And I think adults, you need to put yourself down a bit, you know, like get off your horse, listen to the youth, listen to what they have to say, because their input is as much valuable as that person that you elected. And in most cases, the input that they give is even more valuable than the person that you elected. So I think, um, yeah, we are a strong team, leaders. We are here to make a change, and we will not back down, no matter what anybody says, no matter how much intimidation we get. We are going, and we, we are going to get climate justice. So let's just get over that. Yeah. <laughs> and I will add that we support each other, not only, for example, sharing campaigns, but also sometimes <laughs> It's really difficult, yeah. It's really difficult to be a climate activist and being th like thinking all the time about how what the impact of the climate crisis. So it's really important also to have people to share that feeling and to share that sometimes we are really tired, that sometimes we are really uh, excited or also angry, hungry, uh, <laughs> no hungry, angry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that we have people to share that and also to laugh uh, and to enjoy the time because. Climate activists is also about happiness. It's also about enjoying that time. Yeah, it's about joy and it's about dancing in this resistance because if I can't dance in your resistance, I don't want to be a part of it. So. <laughs> all right. Um, that is an excellent note to finish this uh, talk on. Thank you all so much for sharing your stories and your perspectives um, and your inspiring stories. Uh, thank you for your work. And uh, sorry, you wanted to say something quickly? Can we have a picture with Mitzi yeah, with can us we here? Have a picture, Thank you. Please. Yes, we'll have Back a picture after. That's Thank fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, but first, I think we might finish the session. Thank you oh, all very sorry. much. <laughs>